Hi, we're so glad that you have joined us today and we're excited to be part of your life and we hope you enjoy this message. So what's your greatest fear? What's something that really grips you when you think about it? It might be public speaking and the wonderful MTI students that got up and said, give them one more cheer. These guys is great. You know, for me, I have to say, going back to Australia, I'm reminded of the snakes. They're going to show some pictures of some eastern brown snakes. And, and there's an eastern brown snake, a cuddly looking fellow, isn't he? <laughs> and, uh, you know, those things, you, you, you get bitten by one of those or one of the king brown snakes, you're dead in half an hour. And uh, most of, most, there's only five people basically that die a year, uh, five to seven people die a year in Australia from snake bites, and it's because they have antivenin. A lot of people get bitten, but many people get the, the injections and survive. One of the most dangerous things you can do when you see a snake is pick up a shovel and try and kill it yourself, because they're quick. <laughs> a human picks that up, it's already bitten you on the leg. Those things, and by the way, these ones, the king brown snakes, they can be as long as from me to my wife, and they are strong, and they are stubborn, and you even hit them with a shovel, it doesn't kill them straight away. And so I want to encourage you, if you're ever in Australia and you've got the shovel, run. <laughs> Just don't even, don't even be tempted by that thing. But you're, you're trying to get the snake, and the snake's already gone past you and bitten you three times in the leg. Humans are too slow to deal with those things. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Don't, don't ever try and deal with things yourself. Let God, who's so much wonder, more wonderful, he's working behind the scenes right now. He's so far, so wonderful that he can, can he help us and heal us in so many areas. And so when we look at this, my wife and I were, we were walking a little bit in Australia and, and there's a picture coming up of, of my pastor's house and it says this beautiful deck and we walk in on the deck and we, you know, we, I'd sit on the deck and we'd look out over the back and we'd see down the front yard and across the front uh, yard there's a road and then there's some trees, you can probably see them, and behind the trees is the ocean. And, uh, and so my wife and I are walking along the road. It's just this beautiful situation. She found this pathway and she said, I want to go and see the ocean. I looked at the pathway and it's overgrown. And I said, we're not taking that path. She said, why not? Because at that particular location in Australia on the east coast, up, up northern, middle central, it, there's a load of these snakes. And the higher you get up from Tasmania, we're almost above halfway now on the east coast, it, they get more vicious, more violent because it's, it's hotter. They're faster and they're, they're angrier. I said, we're not going down there, darling. And she said, why? And I said, there's snakes and they're going to bite us and they're going to chase us and gonna, they'll kill us. In half an hour, you're dead. She might have thought that I was overreacting. She eventually said, okay, and we kept walking along the road. We did eventually find our way down to the ocean on a safe path, on, on, on sealed pavement. And she got to dip up toes in or whatever she did. But uh, I, I know, and then and the day after we left... Nancy, my pastor, sent a, a message to Carmen saying, oh, by the way, uh, just outside the deck on those concrete um, steps going up there, Pastor Neil saw a massive snake there the day after you left. I said, see, they were there. <laughs> they were there. And, uh, and uh, anyway, so that's something I'm a little bit afraid of. We all should be to some degree. <laughs> but uh, fear causes us to do silly things and it causes some people to pick up a shovel and try and kill a snake and it kills them. And so John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy's plan for humanity is to destroy the humans. That happened in the garden. He tried to get the humans away from God. His whole plan is to, to divide us from our loving, wonderful creator and bring us out into a lone territory where he can defeat us. But Jesus said, I have come in order that they might, might have life, life in all its fullness, now, what stops humans from having the full expression of the life God gives? One of the most uh, prominent things is fear. Fear is a strategy of the enemy. And we're going to be talking about fear for the next few weeks. We're not focusing on fear. We're going to talk about it to get us open to that fact that the enemy uses fear in our lives that we don't even know is there. This snake was probably under that deck all week, and I was sitting on top of it, just happy. Didn't realize a killer was about that far below me. <laughs> And we don't realize there is fear in us controlling us. And so the strategy of fear, fear is, is an internal trigger. You know, someone says something or a situation inside, you're triggered for some reason. You're angry, you're sad, you're mad, something happens. It's set up from our, our foundational years as a child. 
from zero to seven are the, are the area, time of our life where, where we're being formatted and we're, being, we're, we're most open to, to suggestion and growth and mature. This is our the stage where the enemy sets these landmines in our life. Let, let me give you some examples. The fear of man. You know, as an adult, we can have the fear of humans. It can come out either way. It can come out where we're aggressive and, and we're a bully. A bully is just someone that's, that's picking on smaller, you know, weaker people and that's fear driven. Or it can be someone who is, is afraid and just won't go out in the streets. It's all fear related. So they, as a child, might have been bullied or treated harshly by an older brother, older sister, by a family member, a teacher, someone in the community or a bully. And because of that, they have fear of man in their heart that the enemy can tug on as they grow older. Poverty is a, is a thing that can happen as we're growing up. If, if for some reason, while we're a little child from age zero to seven, our parents lost their job or there's a single parent or we lost our parents or something happened and a travesty came in. And what happens is it causes us as an adult to either retract and move completely away from, from some sort of development or going forward or the opposite causes us to be driven. You know what, I'll never go that place. I'll set up, you know, I'll never be in that situation. And what happens is we're driven by fear. We don't realize the strategy is there. And so when we look at this, the next one is abuse. It could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be sexual abuse. When these things happen in our formative years, zero to seven and even up to 12, what that can do is it can set a landmine in our heart and our life for the future. In a marriage partnership, if a young lady is abused sexually or a young man, it can, get it, and it can start to affect even their sexual relationship, their emotional relationship, so many different areas. Fears have, and there's so much more that can happen as a young person. I've just looked at three, how the enemy sets up. These, this, this bomb on the inside starts to strategically prepare humans so that we can self-destruct. And so that's not God's plan. And the enemy uses these things to stop us from experiencing the fullness of God in our relationships, in our future, in our lives. And so the devil deceives us and rules us from within by our fears to sabotage our future. Anytime we're ruled by fear, anytime we're ruled by these past things on the inside of us, we become a tool of the enemy. We don't realize it. We don't know it's even going on a lot of the times, but we're not controlled by God. And we're not even in our own control. We're out of control. Ever felt out of control? Someone ever cut you off in traffic? Someone ever scraped your car? So, you know, we feel out of control at times. The good news is God helps us to spot fear in and around our hearts, so that we can bring it to him and he can start to work, to heal and deal with those areas. And this whole church we're going to bring, bring through in the next year or so, healing of the heart process, where we can start to have a lot of that stuff dealt with so we're not under the control of the enemy, the devil, or fear. So we want to spot this so we're not deceived. Second Timothy 1.7, we look at this in the Amplified. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, timidity or cowardice. So fear manifests in timidity, pulling away, and cowardice, acts of cowardice. It could be a big bully beating up on a little kid. That's fear-related, an act of cowardice. And cowardice, sorry. And so when we look at this, it's fear. But he has given us a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind or sound judgment in the Amplified. In the New King James, it's sound mind. In the original language, sophronismos, sos, safe. Friend, mind, or thinking. Sophronismos, sound mind. Safe thinking. Safe minds. You know, it it also looks in in, in the Amplified Bible, it, it translates it this way. Sound judgment and personal discipline. Abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind. Felt calm lately? Felt well-balanced lately? And self-control. Whenever we lose self-control, when we're we're not in that place of calm, sound mind, we're unsafe. Who to? Ourselves predominantly. Primarily to ourselves. When we're, when we're out of control, <laughs> you're on the highway and you get out of control. You might try the pit maneuver on a guy. Then you discover, oh, that's a police car. Shouldn't have done. <laughs> Shouldn't have tried that one. <laughs> and so you see the karma videos. I don't believe in karma. But you see them on YouTube and the silly things people do on the road. No, that's because they're out of control. Anytime we're out of the control, out of control, we're a tool of the enemy. Who, no one wants to be a tool. Turn to someone and say, don't be a tool. 
Don't be a fool. Don't be a tool. You don't want to be a tool in the enemy's hands. But you know, when we're young, he sets up these road mines in our hearts through circumstances. Through We've all been through stuff. Put, put up your hand if you haven't. Put up your hand if you have. We've been through stuff in life that has affected our hearts. And now the enemy, can, can, if it's not dealt with, can pull on those heartstrings to control us. Like a bull with a ring in its nose. A big bull. My wife used to be the, the, the 4-H queen. She, imagine her, a little cowboy hat and walking around. 13 years old, pulling a big bull around the thing. Remember that then she, she was crying because she didn't want the bull to get slaughtered because it was one of her pets. She's crying, crying, crying. And here she is, this little girl with this big animal controlling it because of the thing. And so the enemy wants to pull on your heartstrings. By the way, that got so much money came in for that bull. They sold it because of the little tears coming out of her eyes. They sold it when I heard the story years ago. Anyway, back in, so God, God wants us not to be under control of the enemy. He wants us to lose our lives in his love, in his presence. I was listening to a, an amazing song on the way in uh, to church this morning. It says, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When I'm in your presence, fear that is in me doesn't stand a chance. It'll actually get driven out. It'll get dealt with. So the results of fear in our lives, listen to these. Confusion. When we are duped by our own self-deception, a lot of times the, the things we believe come in through the hurts of the past and we're confused. Why isn't life working? How come my marriage isn't working out? How come my kids hate me? How come my boss keeps firing me? I'm confused. Well, it's because we've listened to a lie. And so there's something there that fear is dealt with. Another one, anger, outbursts of rage. This is an unsafe mind. Lack of self-control. Anger, outbursts of rage. It's rooted in fear. Jealousy. Un, you know, it's unhealthy comparison of others. It's rooted in the fear of lack. It's not enough to go around, so I'm jealous because you got your little bit and I don't have it. That's comparison. That's jealousy. You know, so another one is the depression. It's all fear-based. Depression, overwhelmed by obstacles. Ever felt like, oh my gosh, it's too much, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> Come on, that's happened to certain people, personality types. Inactivity, it comes and shuts us down. And so it, it locks our motivation away. As past pain and trauma is revealed to us and healed, the hands of the enemy are taken off our hearts. We're no longer under the control of the enemy. We're no longer a tool of the devil. And our marriages can be wonderful. Our families, our lives, everything can start to work. So today we want to talk a little bit about this fear issue and how to spot it so that we don't get sabotaged. God bless you guys today. Good morning, great church. As you're watching online, give us some hearts today and let us know you're connected to the family. We want to encourage you, if you're watching this on Facebook Live right now, to push the share button. Allow those that you're connected to to be able to link in and hear the message. We're starting a new series today about the good news of overcoming fear. And so if you know people in your life who are struggling with fear, we want you to share this message and share the love. We're going to be on this series for a few weeks. And so we encourage you to share it. We're going to have our time of giving right now. As you're watching online, you can text to give. Use the app to give. Of course, you can mail in your checks. But if you're live today and you need an envelope for your giving, if you lift your hand, our hosts are going to bring that to you. And we're going to look briefly at the Word of God to inspire our generosity today. We're studying Isaiah 32, verse 8. But generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. We've been studying this for the past few weeks, and today we want to look at the definition of the word do. To do is to act, to perform, to undertake. It's where you are engaging in the activity of giving. And so today, as we, as we give, I want to pray God's blessing over you as we take this time to honor God with our generosity. So let's take a moment to pray. Father, today we thank you that you are a generous God. We thank you for the breath in our lungs today, God, the energy in our body, the strength in our body, the creativity you bring to our mind. We recognize, God, that you are a great provider to us, and we honor you today with our giving. God, as we plan to be generous and we activate it today and we are generous, God, I thank you for your blessing on your givers. May you bless them, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, God, their legacy. May you continue to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. 
So we are on a new series together today about the good news of overcoming fear. So I want you to look at the person beside you and say, there's good news. Come on, tell them there's good news that we can overcome fear in our life. Pastor Steve shared 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. And for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Come on, look at the person beside you and say, no fear here. Come on, no fear here. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-control. I, I like that word, self-control. Say it with me. Say, self-control. Did you notice it didn't say others control? Look at the person beside you and say, self-control control, right? It, God has given us the power to control ourselves, love, power, and self-control to be around our own life. And I was thinking about a story in my life as a teenager. I'd went over to France and there was a student exchange program. And so I went to live with the family in France and a, a girl came to live with my family. And so I went over there and their legal age for drinking was much lower than our age of drinking here. And so I just went wild, right? And so I was in the bars and I was drinking every day. And, and you know, I was, I was just living it up. And, and the people that I lived with, he was a doctor and she was a teacher. And so I think they thought Canadians were a little strange by my behavior, but one night I went out and I didn't come back to the house. And I had gotten so drunk and so loaded and I, I, I was so confused and I didn't know where I was and I didn't speak the language properly and there was just absolute chaos and I was afraid and they had come to pick me up and I would not get in the vehicle with them. And they were trying to say, come on, like, we're going to get you in the vehicle. We got to get you home to be safe. And I couldn't understand what was going on. And I was just confused. I was literally out of control. Well, he was a doctor. So he went home to his house and he got, he had a practice in his home. He went and got a tranquilizer and he came back to where I was. It was old school movie style. I'm telling you, it was like, boom, you know? And, and so he gave me a tranquilizer and then put me in the vehicle and took me home. This is a true story, by the way. And uh, so the next morning I wake up and I, my backside is so sore, right? I'm like, what happened? And they're just like laughing, right? And they're like, they know exactly what happened. They explained it to me later, but I was out of control. And so they had given me a tranquilizer to get me in the car and get me back to a safe place. Now, nobody's getting a tranquilizer today, people. So, so don't get worried. Don't get worried. But what I am saying is that when we are fearful, we lack self-control. Wherever there is fear in our life, we start acting crazy. Come on, anybody act a little crazy lately, you know? And we start acting crazy. We start saying crazy things. I mean, that was my safe place to go, yet I wouldn't get in the car with the safe place to go because I was acting crazy. I was out of control. Fear had gripped my life. And wherever there is fear, there is no self-control. And the Bible tells us over and over and over again, do not be afraid. Do not fear. The, the word of God speaks to us about fear over and over. And I have learned over the years that if we're to embrace this abundant life that Jesus has for us, if we're truly to embrace this good life that God has called us to, this, this purpose of God on our life, we have to deal with fear. We've got to be able to spot the fear in our life. You know, you got areas of your life that it's a little bit crazy. Come on, turn to the person beside you and say, she knows what she's talking about. Okay, she knows, there's areas of your life, it's a little crazy. And we've gotta be able to look beyond the circumstances, look beyond the situation and spot, where is the fear? Where is this fear coming from in my life? And one of the greatest freedoms a person can ever experience in life is the freedom from fear. Because fear makes us act strange, right? Anybody act a little strange? I found that most of us are like the rest of us, right? Fear makes us act strange. And so you could ask yourself, why am I acting so crazy? It's fear. Oftentimes people are acting out of a fear and they don't even know it. You'll be like, oh, that's fear. They're like, no, it's not fear. It's just this. And it's just this. And it's just this. And it's just this. And all those things, when you go to the root of it, it's fear. 
And so it's what causes people to act in strange ways. And so we have to learn how to spot the fear. And we're on a series today. We're kicking it off today, but we're going to go through over the next few weeks of spotting fear, spotting the root of fear in our life and being able to deal with the root of fear so that we can truly, truly be free. Come on, look at the person beside you say, I want to be free from fear. Tell them, I want to be free from fear. And this is what the Holy Spirit is leading us to in this season. So we got to spot the fear. Today I get to open up with the word spot. And we're going to look at this today. The letter S is surrender your control. If, if we want to deal with fear, if we want to have that fear, the root of fear taken out of our life, the first place to start is we have to surrender our own control. I was reading about from a psychologist and here's some of the words that I read. Controlling behavior often looks like insecure, anxious attachment. For example, if you're not with me, I can't soothe myself. So I have to know where you are every second. If you've ever met somebody who was a bit controlling, they were calling you all the time. In other words, controlling behavior is a product of anxiety and fear of the unknown. For someone who has control issues or a fear of the unknown, they often don't trust themselves or feel secure enough to meet any challenge or tolerate an unknown situation. So in order to regain some sense of security, they exercise their will and try to control another person in any way they can. Trying to grab control of everything is narcissistic behavior because narcissists are continually disappointed with the imperfect way life unfolds. How many have come to recognize that life unfolds in imperfect ways? Okay. We, we've come to realize it, right? Life unfolds in imperfect ways that they're disappointed with the imperfect way that life unfolds. They try to control it as much as possible. They want and demand to be in control and their sense of entitlement makes it seem logical to them that they should be in control of everything. When someone seeks to control you, it's not coming from a place of love, but in fact, quite the opposite. It comes from a place of fear. Controlling behavior and manipulation are toxic and they don't align with what is necessary for a healthy relationship. And so to surrender your control is the first part of dealing with fear in our life. For wherever there is fear, it tries to control circumstances and the people around them. But what did God say? He says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self control. Come on. Somebody say self control. He didn't say, I give you a, a, a power, love and other control. How many have figured it out? You can't control anybody else. <laughs> Has anybody at that place yet? Okay. You'll get there by the end of today. That's all right. You know, but, but self control and Daniel five twenty three says, but you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Where, wherever we can try to hold on to our own control, wherever we won't surrender control to God, we have not honored the one who gives us the breath of life. We've not honored the one who, who formed us in our mother's womb. We've not honored the one who actually controls our destiny, who actually holds our purpose, our future, our life in his hands. And so as we learn how to surrender our control to his control, we honor God. Romans chapter eight, verse five to six says, people who live following their sinful selves only think about what they want. How many would say you've been guilty once or twice? Come on, let's be honest today. It says when we're focused on our sinful self, it's all about what do I want? What do I want? I mean, we don't care what anybody else wants, right? When you're in that mindset, it's all about me. Look at the person beside you and say, I have been there. I have been there. Let's be honest in church today, right? It's all about what they want. But those who live following the spirit, the Holy Spirit, those who live by the spirit are thinking about what the spirit wants them to do. When we begin to surrender our control to God's control, we begin to think about what God wants to do, how God wants us to interact, how God wants us to respond to situations and people. It says, verse six, if your thinking is controlled by the sinful self, there is spiritual death. 
But if your thinking is controlled by the Spirit, there is life and there is peace. Come on, somebody say life and peace. Those are the two things that we want. We want to experience life, right? We want to enjoy and experience the fullness of life. And we want, and I want to say we need peace. Give me a wave if you need some peace. We need peace in our life. And it says when we learn how to surrender to the control of God, when we learn how to surrender to God, it says that we get this life, this life of peace. Verse 14, I'm going to skip down there. It says the true children of God are those who let God's spirit lead them. That's what we're going to work on. That's what we're journeying through. That's what we're learning together as a church, learning to how to let the spirit of God lead us. Verse 15, the spirit that we have received does not make us, not a spirit that makes us slaves again and causes us to fear, but that spirit we have makes us God's chosen children. And with that spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. As we learn how to surrender to God, we begin to, begin to learn he is our real father and he is a good father and that we can trust our good father and the Holy Spirit always leads us back to the father. You know, that's one of the reasons it's so important that we bring our kids to church. If you brought your kids to church today, I know what you went through if you had little ones. I have been there myself. I want you to give the parents a cheer today for bringing their kids to church. That they can learn from a young age how to deal with fear, how to overcome fear, learning how to surrender to God from a young age. It's so powerful if they can learn it from a young age. Because we know a controlling person always has trouble. Jesus said in Matthew 10 39, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Wherever we try to hold on and control our life and control our situations, it says we end up losing. But Jesus says, wherever you give up your life, you surrender your life, you surrender your control to his control. It says you will find life, life and peace. Proverbs 25, 28 says, losing self-control leaves you as helpless as a city without a wall. When, when, when we're trying to be in control, we lose self-control. And all of a sudden, the walls are down, and the guards are down, and, and, and chaos begins to happen around our life. And that's why God doesn't want us to live in fear. That's why he declared over us, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-control. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 says, I keep every thought under control in order to make it obey Christ. You know, we have thoughts that hit our mind all the time. You might have a thought that just hits your mind right now. And, and every thought that hits your mind, it's, it's not your thought, right? There's just thoughts that, that kind of hit the mind. And, and we have to choose and say, hey, I'm taking those thoughts under control. There is no action without first a thought. How many realize that? Right? I mean, nobody just goes out and kills somebody. Their first was the thought before it happened. Right? And we've got to learn how to take our thoughts, have self-control over our thought life. If we can have self-control over our thought life, when a, when a thought comes to your mind and it's not a good thought, take authority over it. Say, hey, that's not my thought. There, there's a no vacancy sign here. You don't belong in my thinking, right? And then we need to go, take our thoughts to the truth of the word of God. And that's why it's so important that we know the Bible. So I have a question for you. Have, have you ever noticed yourself becoming a little bit of a control freak? Don't look at the person beside you. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to do self-evaluation in church. That's why we come to church. It's for self-evaluation. You know, if you found yourself becoming a little bit of a control freak, do you react poorly when things are not done your way? Do you feel fear, anxiety, or does it come out in anger? It could be an outburst of anger on someone, or it could be the cold, you know, silent treatment, avoidant anger. Both are anger. And, and this could be because there is a, a, a controlling nature in you that it stems from fear. And wherever we have control issues, it's because of a lack of trust in God. It's a lack of trust in God that there's something in us that has not come to the place of understanding. God has a good plan. 
His plan will trump any plan that we make. His plan will be greater than any plan we could ever design. His plan will be the best design that there ever could be. And so it's surrendering our control to his plan and his will for our life. A controlling person is actually being controlled by a spirit of fear or a spirit of pride or a mixture of the two. You know, but the Bible gives us the answer. We have the good news. The good news is the Bible gives us the answer to deal with fear. And the good news is the Bible gives us the answer to deal with pride, to set us free so that we are not bound by fear, but we are living in the freedom and the fullness that God has in store for us. And so we got to be able to spot the fear. The letter P in spot is position yourself under God's peace. Now, God's peace is available for everyone. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't pick and choose and go, oh, I'll let some peace over on this side, but mm, not you guys. You got to wait till next week. No, God's peace is available for everyone. It's our choice to be able to position ourselves to receive from God's peace. We have to position ourselves to be receivers of God's peace. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, don't worry about anything. But pray about everything. I want to encourage you today that God cares about everything you care about. It might be small, it might be medium, it might be large, but if it's on your heart, God cares about it. And we can take it to him in prayer. We can talk to God about anything that's going on. It says, with thankful hearts, offer up your prayers and requests to God. Then because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one else can completely understand. When you got the peace of God, other people are like, how do you got peace? It's like nobody else is gonna understand completely this supernatural, incredible touch of the peace of God over your life. God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control the way you think and feel. If you get under his peace, it will begin to control the way you think and the way you feel. It will begin to settle you down. It will begin to, to open your eyes. It'll begin to draw wisdom to you. Come on, how many need the peace of God? We need to position ourselves under the peace of God. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. You know, there's somebody can offer you, you know, peace in a moment that has nothing to do with God. If you've ever been high, you know, you can get peace in a moment. You know, you're, you're struggling with something and, you know, you have a couple drinks, takes the edge off. That's false peace that will not last. When you go to God's peace, the peace that he gives, the Bible says other people cannot understand it because it's a peace that isn't here today and gone tomorrow. It's a peace that begins to reside within. It begins to lead you and draw you to the right solutions. We need God's peace in our life. And we looked at Romans 8 verse 6 that if your thinking is controlled by the sinful self, there's spiritual death. But if your thinking is controlled by the spirit, there is life and there is peace. And we need this peace. We've got to learn how to relax, let go of our own control and receive his peace. Position yourself to receive his peace. Allow yourself to calm down. Remind yourself of the goodness of God. You know, meditate on the truth of the word of God. You should already have one verse picked out, memorized, or put somewhere that you can go to. When you get all riled up and things are kind of feeling a little crazy, you got to get out of the situation. Maybe you got to go for a walk. Maybe you got to go to the bathroom, shut the door. I don't know what it is, but get yourself in the place and say, God, I need your peace. And allow yourself to calm down and begin to focus on the truth of what God is saying to you. Proverbs 14 verse 30 says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. You know, some people are going to die early because they haven't learned how to receive from God's peace. They're all wound up and they're, they're, everything is, is tied up in a knot all the time. We have to learn how to relax and receive the peace of God. Receive the confidence. God, you're working on my behalf. God, I know you're moving behind the scenes. God, I know you got this. I know you're working on my behalf. I, I surrender to you. I receive your peace. A relaxed attitude lengthens life. 
I remember being on a missions trip with a bunch of people from the church, one person in particular, I'm not going to point them out, but they're on the front row, and, and we're on a missions trip together. And, and you know, we're, we're in Haiti, and we're going around the curves, and we're going around the cliffs, and they were just so afraid. And they would, be like, they would start, you know, saying things really loud, and they were full of fear, and I was like, we're going to learn a Bible verse in this car. And we're going to memorize this verse together. A relaxed attitude, everybody who was on that mission trip remembers, a relaxed attitude lengthens life. And so every time we ended up in a scary situation, he'd go, ah! I was like, what's the verse? Say the verse. A relaxed attitude lengthens life. I'm like, you learning to relax is not only going to lengthen your life, it's going to lengthen my life. <laughs> right? Because, because that stress is starting to invade my space, right? Your holler is starting to invade my peace, right? And so he was sitting behind me in the truck. I'm like, what's the verse? What's the verse? Right? Come on, we got to embrace it together. A relaxed attitude, it lengthens our life. And not only does it lengthen it, it gives us the peace to enjoy the journey when we learn to trust the peace of God. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ, the inner calm. Come on. Some of you need an inner calm. I need an inner calm. Look at the person beside you. Say, I can feel it coming to me. Come on, an inner calm, a calmness on the inside of us. Let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of the one who walks daily with him. So my question is, do you walk daily with him? Do you carve out the time to walk daily with your maker, with the one who made you, with the one who knows you, with the one who put you together, the one who gave you that personality, gave you that sense of humor, gave you that gift mix? Do you walk daily with the one who knows you? It says, if we want to walk in this inner calm, if we want to walk in this peace, we've got to walk daily. But some people aren't walking daily. They're walking weekly, monthly, maybe yearly, involving God. But God says, walk with me daily. Let his peace walk with you daily. We need a relationship with God every day. How many have ever tried a day without Jesus? Come on. A day without Jesus, all chaos goes forth, right? It's like, how could all that happen in 24 hours? We need to walk daily with God. It says, the peace of Christ, the inner calm of the one who walks daily with him. Let it be the controlling factor in your hearts. Let go of you trying to control your life and let his peace, let walk with him daily. Let that be the controlling factor in your hearts. It says, deciding and settling the questions that arise. God knows you got questions. Is this going to work or is this going to work? Is it going to turn out like that? Or is it going to turn out like that? And we got these questions stirring inside of us. And the questions, what do they do? They rob us of our peace. But if you go to God and walk daily with God, he will settle the questions that arise. I'm not telling you that he's always going to give you the answer. Because sometimes he's not. But what he will do is he will assure you. He will bring a peace inside. Whether it goes this way or whether it goes that way. It's all going to be okay. You're for surely goodness and mercy. It's going to follow you all the days of your life. For surely he's going to be with you. For surely he's going to open a door. For surely he's going to walk with you. So it's not so matter, but is it going to turn out like this? Or is it going to turn out like this? Is it going to go this way? Or is it going to go that way? God's going to settle the questions in your heart. It's not really about that. It's about walking with God because he's going to take you through to the other side into a place that's greater than you've ever been before. So it's, it will settle the questions that arise. And this peace indeed, you were called. Do you know you were called to live in this peace? You weren't called to live in chaos. You weren't called to live in fear. You were called to live in the peace of God. You were called to live in the security of knowing that your God, your Father, is on your side and He is moving on your behalf. It goes on to say, and be thankful to God. How many are thankful that God is working for you right now? That he is our helper and he's helping us right now. For God is our helper and he's helping us right now. We've got to spot the fear. The letter O is op oppose the lies of the enemy. We've got to spot the fear and recognize, oh, that's fear. We've got to be able to oppose the lie of the enemy and recognize that's a lie. That, is, that isn't truth. And wherever there's a lie, it's going to cause confusion and fear in our life. And over the next few weeks, we're going to deal with the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, 
the fear of not getting what you want right or the fear of of sharing your faith with someone else actually i want to encourage you if you know someone who doesn't know jesus yet and, and you know that they struggle with fear i want you to bring them next sunday okay let them be part of the series as we begin to peel back the onion layers of fear and bring freedom i want you to bring them with you so that they can experience this freedom with you and alongside you ephesians chapter 4 15 said instead speaking the truth in love we will grow to become in every respect mature we got to expose the lies of the enemy through the truth of God and the truth through the truth of God we will grow come on look at the person beside you and tell them I'm growing and it says and become mature look at the person beside you and say I'm becoming more mature look at that person and say good news I'm, I'm glad for you good news this is good news right we're becoming more mature together all the married couples are like I am not saying that to her I am not looking at her and saying that okay but it's good news we're growing good news we're becoming more mature we've got to expose and oppose the lies of the enemy line number one is you can do it your own way and still be successful that is the number one lie of the enemy. You can do it your own way and still be successful. Well, you just tried doing marriage your way. It won't work. Try raising kids your own way. It won't work. Try doing finances your own way. It won't work. Try taking on your own physical health your own way. It won't work. You know, why is it that we try to do it our way? It's, 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 we have to expose and oppose and push off that lie of the enemy. I can do it my own way and it'll work out. No, 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 no. We have to realize I got to do it God's way. He made me, he designed me and his way is perfect for me. And it's the only thing that will bring total fulfillment in our life. Galatians chapter three, verse three to four. Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think that they could complete by their own efforts what was, what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough and strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? Yet it's not a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. It says it's crazy to think that he who's begun a good work in me. God's the one who started something good inside of us. It's crazy to think now I can just take it in my own hands and do it my way and it'll all work out. It says it's craziness. And it says you've been through some painful processes. Come on, give me a wave if you've been through some painful processes of doing it your own way. And it says, you know, uh, is it going to be a total loss? It, it was the painful learning process for nothing. How many want to learn from your pain? We don't need to repeat it. It says, but it's not a total loss. If we begin to understand, God, I need your truth. I cannot do it without you. Line number two is that you are smarter than God in his word. How many have ever believed that, that lie? I'm smarter than God. I'm smarter than the Bible. Like I know the Bible says that, but I got a better way. You know, I know the Bible says to do it like this, but you know, I think I gotta, I think my way's smarter. Come on, give me a wave if you've done it. Most of us are like the rest of us. We've tried it. We thought we were smarter than God. Proverbs 19, three says people ruin their lives by their own stupidity. So why does God always get blamed? So it's like, I'm smarter than God. The Bible says to do it like this. But I'm going to do it like this. And it says, then you end up in chaos and you ruin your life. And then what do you do? Blame God. Well, where was God? Why didn't God do something, right? And, and we begin to blame God, yet it was our own decision. We had thought we were smarter than God. We thought we were smarter than the B-I-B-L-E, the book that has surpassed every generation, the book that cannot be destroyed, the book that has the words of life in it. And yet... Sometimes we think we're smarter. Proverbs 26, 12 says, see the man who thinks he's so smart. You can expect far more from a fool than him. We've got to recognize that, that God leads us in truth because he's trying to take us somewhere great. That his truth is there to guide us to our purpose and his plan. Proverbs 16, 18 says, first pride 
then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. How many have felt the fall? <laughs> I felt the fall. I was like, ooh, the bigger the ego, the harder the fall, right? And so we have to recognize I'm not smarter than God, and I'm not smarter than the Word of God, and begin to embrace the truth of God, oppose the lies of the enemy, and embrace the truth of God. And the letter T today in spot fear, and I know you'll know what this T is going to be, trust God. People say, I can't. I can't trust him. You know what? God wired into you the ability to trust him. It is inside of you. When, when the humans were made, God wired in the ability for you to trust God. You can trust God. He has put it on the inside of you. The world has tried to take it from you, but God has put it inside of you and it cannot be stolen. It cannot be robbed. You have the ability to trust God on the inside of you. Psalm 56 verse 3 says, even when I'm afraid, I still trust you. We all feel fear. We all feel afraid at times. But if we will learn to spot that fear and in the midst of feeling that fear, we run to God and say, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I trust you in my life. I trust you, God. It's amazing how that fear will begin to surrender in, our, in the midst of us trusting him. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 12 says, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Let's do it together, right? Don't try to figure it all out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. How many want the glow back? Come on, we need the glow back, right? We need the glow back on us. Or we're trusting God. Your body will glow with health. And it says, and your very bones will vibrate with life. There's this place when we're trusting God, we come alive. We come alive inside again. We're not dormant. We're not stuck in a rut. We come alive when we trust in the one who made us, the one who knows us. We come alive inside. It says, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim, brim over. But don't, dear friends, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It's the child he loves that God corrects. A father's delight is behind it all. If you feel today, you're like, oh, God, why are you calling me out? I'm being a control freak. <laughs> hey, most of us are like the rest of us. Let's be honest in church, right? So it's like, don't sulk under his correction. Don't be angry that, that he shows and puts a, puts a light on an area of your life. He's like, I'm going to free you from fear. We're going to deal with that fear. We're going to peel it back like the layers of an onion. And you're going to be free of fear so you can walk in life and you can walk in peace. Don't resent his correction. Don't sulk under his. It says it's the, it's the child he loves. How do you know it? a parent loves the child? It's the parent that will correct the child. Because that parent says, oh my goodness. I don't want you to have a beautiful future. I don't want you to run in front of that car and die. I don't want you to go this direction and have your life swallowed up. A parent who loves the child will correct the child because they say, there's something great for you. I want you to fulfill your purpose. That's your father in heaven looking at you, looking at me going, come on. I know you got a purpose on your life. I'm going to walk with you. I've got some good, good, good plans for you. And I don't want you missing out on even one of them. That's the father who loves you. And Psalm 56 verse 3 says, when struck by fear, I let go, depending securely upon you alone. This week, if fear strikes you, you feel that fear and you start acting a little weird. I want you to go to God, run to God and say with your own lips, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. When, when fear strikes you, God, I, I depend on you. I put my faith and I put my trust in you. I want to close with this scripture today in Proverbs 16, verse 3. It says, commit your works to the Lord. Submit and trust them to him. And your plans will succeed. 
You have plans, you have desires, you have dreams. And God knows this. Commit your works to the Lord. Submit and trust them to him. And your plans will succeed. If, somebody say if. If you will respond to his will and his guidance. He knows you got plans. He knows you have dreams. He knows you have desires, right? It says commit these desires, these dreams to God. Submit, the word submit means accept or yield to the authority to no longer resist their leadership. It's to no longer resist the leadership of God. To say, God, I trust you. God, I submit to your plan for my life. It says that he's going to help the plan succeed if, if you respond to his will and respond to his guidance. And I believe the Holy Spirit in this series is going to help us to spot the fear. Not just so we can identify it, but so we can deal with it. And that that fear is removed and you're able to live in the freedom that Jesus died on the cross for. And that's what I want to pray for you today. So you can close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment today. If you're in this room today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you today is the day. The whole message has been about accepting him to be the leader in your life. It's not just about knowing the Christmas story or knowing the Easter story. It's about opening the heart and saying, God, I need you to be the leader in my life. If you've never done that, I encourage you today is the day to do it. Second question I want to ask today is if you say, I'm a Christian already. I gave my life to God. But, but you can feel through the message, you feel God's loving hand saying, oh, you know, there's fear issues here. There's control issues here. And, and, and he points it out because he is, he is the healer of our soul. He, he's the one who can deliver us from the spirit of fear. For he did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-control. And he's wanting to come alongside you and help you if you will let him. And so today, if you've never given your life to Jesus, or number two, you realize today, God, I got to trust you more than I've ever trusted you before. I got, I got to surrender more than I've surrendered before. Maybe you need to position yourself under his peace and, 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 and receive that peace that passes all understanding today. I want to encourage you, if either one of those are you, with no one looking around for a moment, I want you to lift your hand. I want to know who I'm praying for today. Okay, fantastic, 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 fantastic. I want to encourage every person, put your hand on your heart today. I want to encourage you to repeat these words out loud after me. Nice and loud, nice and bold, so the person sitting beside you doesn't feel like their voice is the only one they're hearing. And when we're done praying this prayer, I want to pray over you as well. And so I invite you to repeat these words in prayer with me and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, Jesus, I open the door of my heart and the door of my life, and I choose you to be the leader in my life. Today, I surrender to you. I choose you, and I trust you with my future in Jesus' name. Now, I want to pray over you. Father, today, I thank you for your spirit of peace peace that passes all understanding. If you know you need it right now today with no one looking around, lift your hands. God, I thank you for your spirit of peace. It comes to rule in our heart. It comes to guide us in our decision making. It comes to lead us into your freedom. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, right now for your peace. Not the world's peace, but your peace coming to rule and reign in your sons and daughters' hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you today. Wow, that was another amazing message from Pastor Steve and Pastor Carmen. If it's your first time here with us, please visit one of the welcome tables on the way out. Uh, you can join us here in the building at 9.30 a.m. or 11 a.m. every Sunday, or you can watch online at greatchurch.ca at 11, 12, 32, and 4 p.m. Um, and if you want to go back and watch the message again or share it with someone, you got something from this, and maybe you have someone in mind you want to share this with, you can also share the messages at greatchurch.ca. Just go there, find the message, and you can share it with some friends. Um, uh, you can join us here 
here every single Wednesday and in the building for small groups. I would encourage you to come out here, get connected. It's a great way to have fellowship with other believers. You can come here at 7 p.m. And uh, this uh, Saturday, we're having a, uh, there's the parade happening here in Spruce Grove. And it's a great way for the, in, in Stony Plain, sorry. And it's a great way for the church to outreach. So if you want to be part of that, you can learn more about it in the coffee shop. Uh, it's a great way for you to uh, just be around other believers, share the gospel, share your faith with others, and really just spread the good news to, to other people that need to hear it. So um, if you want to come out to that, just ask someone uh, in the foyer or in the coffee shop, and they'll give you all the details on that. It's happening on June 1st. Um, and for everyone here that's doing the baby dedications, uh, we're going to be doing that right away. So just stick around. God bless you. Have a great day. And we'll See you next week. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed the message, that you've gotten something out of it. We want to encourage you to go to greatchurch.ca and begin to follow us and I mean, tune in next week. We are going to be ready for you. We want you to be there. We want to be able to share with you what God has put on our heart.